The amoebic sea, also known as Mare amoebicus, is a vast, gelatinous, sea-like organism on Darwin IV, located in Planitia borealis. It is a vast matrix of symbiotic life forms. It is Darwin IV's strangest biome. This bizarre and misnamed biome region is blanketed by a gelatinous, 10-meter deep organism covering almost 5% of the planet's surface, it is, in fact, the largest single colony animal known. Possibly because of the shock absorption and weight distribution qualities of the jelly-like sea, the sea striders that live on it have attained truly behemoth proportions. No other known creature rivals them in size. The periphery of the sprawling amoebic sea is an almost bleak and seemingly inhospitable region. As the sea has been seemingly receding its margins have left a flattened landscape, the sea's floor, as it were. A number of creatures roam these almost featureless wastes. The stripewing is a nocturnal, flightless, peripheral, gregarious flyer from around the amoebic sea. These odd-looking creatures appear to be in evolutionary flux, they are winged and yet are unable to fly. When attempts are made the two-meter-tall creatures will flap their stubby, beautifully striped wings in a vain effort to get airborne and will only manage a long hop. During the day the stripewings seem to lead a lazy lifestyle, bobbing on the undulating surface of the amoebic sea. At intervals they will simply extend their proboscises and begin to feed. The rest of the time, they do nothing but bob and doze. But with the onset of night, the stripewings begin to stir. Heads pop up, wonderfully glowing wings unfurl, and the creatures rise to their feet on the shimmering, quivering surface of the gel. In a moment, what has been a peaceful scene is now a riot of movement as flocks begin their nocturnal rounds. There appears to be nothing else on Darwin IV quite as outlandish as the wild chases the stripewings lead at night. For hours the troops of gaudy winged lunatics flap their way across the sea's surface in the most circuitous and erratic of patterns. All night the creatures hop, bound and cavort through the darkness, a tumbling jumble of green banded wings and bodies. The reason for the strange behavior is puzzling one theory is that these are pursuits of airborne microflyers another theory is that these are hormonal triggered courtship rites by the time the sky begins to silver the have grown appreciably less energetic slowing down daybreak finds the odd creatures wearily settled on the seas surface folding their wings and tucking their snouty heads down they will gradually drop off to sleep and it is then wondered if they are dreaming. The Littorolope is a large quadruped alien inhabitant of the littoral zone around the amoebic sea to being gregarious creatures that move in large herds throughout these regions the Littorolope has a voluminous body with very protruding hips and shoulders short legs but with long sturdy feet and a medium-sized arrow-shaped head with two long protuberances extending to the sides facing backwards and a large nostrils in the upper part with a small mouth similar to that of a catfish below its skin is smooth being quite polished and without any rough or irregular texture except in the belly that has striations through it being predominantly white and apparently these are able to glow its whole body in a green lithe tone in the dark a feature no found in other species these lives in long herds of tens of individuals constantly communicating with sounding pins to each other they seem to be omnivores able to feed on any type of material including the matrix of the amoebic sea. The sack back is a strange bulky red it is one of the few notable exceptions of Darwin IV creatures to not be hermaphroditic they also have one of the more bizarre procreation rituals on the planet protruding from the level surface of a beach near the amoebic sea will be groups of half a dozen bud-like forms they are meter high semi-rigid stalks surmounted by horny beak-like mouths each of which open at regular intervals to exhale a cloud of steamy air adjacent Adjacent to each stalk is a thinner more flexible tentacle which writhes in constant motion each tentacle is terminated by a broad flattened hand which looks quite dexterous the stalks will twitch the mouths will open. Arms occasionally flick some small, unwary creature into the mouth, and that is all. With a low frequency pinging, a sack back will head for these locations. It is a bulky, red creature with a stalk, mouth, and tentacles similar to those protruding from the ground. The beast is named the sack back for it carries on its broad back a large transparent sack filled with colorless fluid. With each lumbering step this sack wobbles and the small, beaky mouth puffs out vapor. The creature seems to be laboring under its heavy burden. The ungainly animal slowly humps itself over to a stalk and settles above it. The great beast aligns its stalk with the one beneath it and reaches out. 
with the most sensitive caresses. The two hands touch as if greeting, stroke and then clasp each other. After the hands clasp, the sack back repositions itself so that its beak is positioned over the stalks. When this alignment is achieved, both mouths open and the large creature pours a stream of clear liquid into the awaiting mouth below. This takes about three minutes. All the while, the sac backs emptying dorsal sac ripples in a kind of peristaltic spasm. When the sac is entirely empty, both mouths snap shut in unison. The caressing of the hands begins anew and continues for about 10 minutes. Then there is a movement on the ground directly under the sac back's flat tail. A small depression forms, and there is a glistening lipped tube within. At this point it is concluded that the ambulatory sac back is a male, for a large phallus snakes out and probes the circular depression. This organ is wholly different from the standard sexual equipment seen mostly on Darwin IV, it is a solid tube instead of the customary unfurling tube possessed by the majority of the planet's animals. More importantly, it is tangible proof of the existence of two sexes within this species. The disc flyer is a small, gregarious, migratory, disc-shaped flyer found mainly around the amoebic sea as well as other regions on Darwin IV. When traveling in long flights at night, they glow. Their dispersal across the amoebic sea, living in dense clouds encountered every four kilometers or so, seems to indicate a territorial pattern. Though it is still uncertain as to the actual nature of the territories involved. On some occasions disc flyers will be at rest on the gel surface, possibly feeding. It can only be guessed that the four kilometer wide territories represent the feeding radius of the odd flyers. During spring in the circumpolar tundra around Glacier Cap North, the melted snow and softened ground frees not only the gently glowing buds of low, hardy tundra plants, it also frees the vast hibernating populations of disc flyers, which take wing and ascend in swirling clouds into the air. The beach quill is a small, communal, dangerous, predatory, arrow-shaped creature. Hidden about 30 centimeters beneath the soft soil of the littoral zone are rafts of these communal hunters. Often numbering in the scores, these dart-shaped creatures lie in wait for the unwary passerby to tread on the soil directly above them. As they rely primarily on their sensitive pressure receptors, their sonar is nearly non-existent. These short-range attack hunters are able to propel themselves with enormous velocity over short distances. They launch themselves by means of a folded muscular foot that snaps the individual animal through the concealing ground toward its target. After a kill, the beach quills will instinctively regroup and bury themselves, leaving no visual evidence of their existence. Their immobility and silence are perfectly evolved hunting techniques on a sonar-based planet. As the beach quills range is limited by the density and composition of the soil it lives in, it is found exclusively in the littoral zone. Such prey items include beach lopers, which will sometimes wander into a bed of beach quills. It is not a pleasant scene, 50 or so beach quills suddenly burst from the ground around the peripheral and within seconds have punctured it mercilessly, delivering a fatal dose of neurotoxins. The force of their attack is so great that the creatures that miss the prey bounce harmlessly off other objects some 20 meters from their launch bed. The prey is dead before it hits the ground. A bizarre feast follows with the beach quills that have struck home eating their way out of the carcass, and those that have missed eating their way in. An hour later the prey's bones lay exposed on the ground and the beach quills have vanished, leaving no trace. The Emperor Sea Strider is an enormous bipedalian from the amoebic sea of Darwin IV. It is easily the largest of the planet's creatures. Their young are capable of flight. The first sign of these creatures' approach begins with a dull roaring. It is a low noise, which at first seems to be echoing thunder. It is, however, too continuous to be atmospheric. Then there are the rhythmic vibrations, tremors of sorts. These seismic sensations are similar with the huge keeled grove backs, but these figures indicate an even larger creature. The size of this magnificent animal is stunning. It has a great crested head, its sides, heaving with the enormous effort of its walking can be buffeted by gale force winds, virtually no force in nature can affect such a creature. The immense bipedalian's roaring is very loud. It is believed that this sound originates from the two huge gills far up the torso in the bony collar. It also has frequent low-range sonar calls, their source being an array of blue glowing pseudo-arms, which gracefully sway and point. It strides slowly, measuring its vast footfalls, navigating like an ancient ship on some far-off, 
watery sea. Emperor Sea Striders travel in what appear to be mated pairs, they head in the same direction. At times, there can be a sharp whining nearby, similar to the scream of jet engines. It belongs to a flight of small black creatures, faintly bio-lit, heading directly towards the ponderous giants. They careen and bank and, oblivious to gusting winds and lightning that sometimes sweep over the sea, steer straight into an opening in the front of the Sea Striders carapace. They reappear seconds later, having flown through the huge beast's chest and out the fiery exit gill, the bio lights on the small flying creatures blaze with renewed energy. Their tails alight with flaming exhaust, the creatures circle almost playfully, leaving behind long gray vapor trails that are twisted into sinuous corkscrews by the wind. There is a distinct similarity between the flyer's crests and those of the sea striders, for the small creatures are the nymph forms of the dark titans they attend. Somehow, as they entay, are their parents' bodies they feed upon energy-rich secretions that renew and nourish them recent research which included charting the nymph's growth to massive adulthood has proven this theory correct the sea striders' oversized feet which are hollow and contain huge oral tubes kick up thin mists of minute jelly shavings each oral tube which leads up through the thighs and into the torso begins as a mouth on the soles of the feet where it is rimmed with thousands of sharp teeth as the beast walks each sliding footfall shaves off a thin layer of gel which is quickly sucked up and digested it is indicated they are about 190 meters tall but this estimated accuracy is not entirely certain they have irregular tiers of lateral breathing flaps opening and closing with each footfall gently glowing blue bio lights accenting the smooth curve of their crests and swaying tails the enormous skull of a sea strider is riddled with innumerable nerve holes and sutures it also has a huge and primitive brain case something of an enigma the towering creature's internal structure seems to become more rigid and lightweight as it approaches its crown with the denser leg muscles and pelvis tissue keeping the center of gravity low amazingly despite its massive and imposing Sizeth emperor sea strider can be attacked by skewers on rare occasions hunting in pods of up to 30 or more individuals these predators can overcome even the largest of darwin iv's inhabitants in the case of both emperor and lesser sea striders young are raised in a unique way the eggs of these huge creatures are dropped onto the seas undulating surface where they remain until they hatch upon emerging from the eggs to nymphs must find their way back to their parents until they are fully independent possibly because of the shock absorption and weight distribution qualities of the jelly-like sea the sea striders have attained truly behemoth proportions no other known creature rivals them in size The ebony blisterwing is a massive dark-colored flyer native to Darwin IV with a wingspan of about 300 meters it is among the largest living things on Darwin IV alongside the Emperor Sea Strider and Groveback and the planet's biggest aerial species. Ime equals 0.4 s, greater than it lives exclusively in the skies of the planet where it glides high above the plains true to its name it blisterwing has ebony dark brown skin and boasts large gas filled bladders on its and body used for flying in air the tail of the ebony blisterwing splits up into two appendages what Wayne Barlow calls twin tail booms it is unknown what the diet of this giant animal is it may be microflyers creatures living in air or it may be capable of photosynthesizing on earth there are many animal species with that ability like the sea slug Elysia chlorotica. The Eosapien is a large social adroit omnivorous highly intelligent floater from the planet of Darwin IVIT is the most intelligent life form on the whole planet this huge creature can float absolutely motionless and move just about any direction similar to Earth's dragonflies and hummingbirds a sign that these floaters approach will be indicated by what appears to be an array of approximately 2 meter long flyers vectoring directly and they have originated from a floating source sometimes 100 kilometers away this mysterious floater will produce sonar that is hollow and echolachy times imitating the sonar of other creatures with identical beacons the flyers are not incoming missile snore are they true flyers in the biological sense they airy instead dart like organic projectiles vanned and streamlined for subsonic flight on their dark chitinous surfaces there are tiny teardrop shaped blisters located toward the back of each projectile are four recessed holes and complemented by an oval vein mounted on a thin stock these veins will twitch fractionally to alter course though a projectile's exterior is cool the interior indicates a single small Small life form with a high metabolic level thermal images are vague but there is the impression of jointed chitinous plates arms and bladders all beautifully filled within the narrow confines of the projectile over the next hour or so the projectiles will slow and change their outer conformation as they do the tiny blisters expand and fill with buoyant gases. 
greater than eventually the formerly missile-shaped objects are four times their original size and are drifting at the mercy of the winds. The giant floater that released the projectiles will move at a leisurely rate through the air, including in clouds, pinging in a way oddly different from anything so far discovered on Darwin IV. There is a decided complexity to the ambiguous sounds, and to the responses that come in. It feels as though it is a conversation. Looming a full 20 meters in height, it is a veritable study in alienness. Its cuticle-covered body is an intricate collection of ridges, folds and curves flanged and wrinkled so as to almost defy description. Here a pair of moisture-dampened openings quiver and flare, while behind float bladders pulse and expand with inrushing air. A web of glowing bio-lights surround a small pair of recessed infrared pits. Two swinging, orange sonar booms stretch from beneath enormous, overhanging fins. Above them a pair of gyrating balance organs oscillate in a blur of constant movement. Surmounting the forward, vertical portion of the organism's body is a great translucent bladder that seems to be its principal organ of buoyancy. Running throughout this vast sagittal sac is a fine tracery of veins, which can be delicately backlit by flowing clouds behind. But most remarkable of all, two muscular arms, terminating in dexterous-looking hands, hang from the creature's sides. This creature can sometimes be seen carrying a giant club. Here is the impression of some degree of sentience. For this floater can seem in no particular hurry to disengage from any mutual observations. The floater is named Eosapien, meaning Dawn Thinker, since it seems wonderfully appropriate for a creature seemingly on the threshold of intelligence. This creature has a long tail, beneath which runs in sheath-like growth. It is from this orifice that the projectiles, in fact, airborne ooh the sea or eggs, are launched. The sun's radiation in these rarefied levels of the atmosphere is in some way instrumental in their hatching. When communicating with one another in a group, an alpha can direct the others with a steady flow of signals into their midst, either with short pings or longer ones. When partaking in finding something new, they can s. queek and ping attentively, shifting a club here or a sonar boom there. Each individual bears a unique pattern of bio-lights that seem to distinguish one individual from another, and some might wear what might be vertebrae strung on fibrous cords, hanging from their tails like trophies. They are solemn dignified and, above all, aware. These individuals with clubs and hunting trophies are obviously members of hunting parties. Eosapiens are remarkably fast. When hunting, they are often in pursuit of some victim on the ground far below them adjusting and readjusting their immensely powerful sonar booms. Each hunting Eosapien carries club-like implements, which are huge flechettes. Upon targeting their prey, Eosapiens release their missiles with such a rapidity that it can seem as though a kill can only be attained by chance. Sometimes, Eosapiens will go to the amoebic sea for food. They find occasional great puckered openings on the surface of the sea. Out of this opening will appear huge globules of gel, backlit, looking like giant water droplets filled with spinning organelles, pouring upward in lazy slow motion, sometimes hanging hundreds of meters above the amoebic sea. Eosapiens will follow their ascent, systematically puncturing the globules and inserting their trunks to drink. 